Beavis and Butthead. They are cultural touchstones of the 90s and have gone on to represent an entire generation. Through their timeless stupidity, they've managed to accumulate eight seasons worth of antics, creating a franchise so powerful it's entered the capitalistic loop of never being allowed to leave. Ever. But given its remarkably simple premise, what allowed these two specific faces to become so instantly iconic? How did such a show get picked up? And what made it resonate so much with viewers? For a show so remarkably surface level, there's a surprising amount of depth behind it. Now to preface, I decided to embark on the foolish journey of watching all 222 episodes ever produced. A task not even creator Mike Judge himself would have wanted. This video is going to be half analysis and half reviewing every season of the show. And with that out of the way, let's start from the beginning. Throughout 1981, Judge began producing his own shorts which he animated, voice acted, and even scored all by himself. He then submitted them to a local animation festival. The effort paid off, with several being acquired by networks to air on television. His most notable customer would be MTV, who ran an animation block at the time for independent artists called Liquid Television. The artist eventually settled on two characters he created named Beavis and Butthead. They were cruel, thrill-seeking teens who stopped at nothing to see something cool. Judge produced two animations with the characters, underscored with the now iconic theme song he created. The first was Frog Baseball, which is pretty self-explanatory. The other was Peace, Love, and Understanding, which had the boys attend a monster truck rally. It ends with the hippie liberal named Van Driesen being run over after a poorly received speech. Despite, or perhaps because of the crudeness and profanity, MTV loved it. They loved it so much, in fact, that they immediately offered to develop it into a fully-fledged show. We wanted to, to develop it as a series. We tested it. It tested through the roof. In fact, one kid stayed after and said, can I buy, can I buy this out of the tape machine? They approached Judge with what in retrospect was an insane proposal a contract for 65 episodes. In just three years, he'd gone from discovering the medium to directing multiple seasons of his own show. And less than four months after the shorts aired, the first season of Beavis and Butthead was set to premiere. The first season of Beavis and Butthead is rough, to say the least. Judge is known for his pseudo-realistic art style that adheres strictly to model sheets. It gives a lot of weight to their movements. But here, Beavis and Butthead seem to go off model in every frame. They didn't quite grasp yet how to handle the characters or how they'd exist in a three-dimensional space. What do you think they pay for, like, a gallon of blood? Just be cool, dude. There are only three episodes, so this is one of the rare times I can talk about all of them. Door to Door has the duo going around the neighborhood for a school fundraiser. <laughs> they are kidnapped by a dominatrix to no resolution. Whose wrath do you fear? Yours, Mistress Cora. Yeah. <laughs> Van Driesen is brought back as their teacher. In episode two, they attempt to earn money by donating blood, but accidentally give too much. They end up going home with massive bags of blood, which Budhead smashes over Beavis's head. The third episode begins with the two bringing balloons to the aquarium to plug the holes of dolphins. Hijinks ensue, as Beavis ends up floating over the pool and falling in. The writing leaves a lot to be desired. Their punchlines are pretty weak, making the endings feel abrupt. Did you pee in the pool because you were smart or because you were scared? <laughs> no, dude, because it feels good. To be fair, part of this was probably because of how short the story segments are, amounting to about 4 minutes each. In substitute of a B-plot, the show is interspersed with the duo reacting to music videos. Yeah. <clears throat> they actually make up the majority of this season, though that balance changed over time. You People not familiar with the show are often surprised by this, because even today it's a pretty unique formula. I mean, how many other cartoons can play Smells Like Teen Spirit in full? This kicks butt. Navarna is cool. This was only possible due to MTV, who had the broadcasting rights to avoid such a licensing nightmare. That guy's touching his wiener. The commentary was improvised, with the duo deriding videos based on Judge's taste. If he liked the song, it'd play in its entirety as the characters headbanged. And if he didn't, they'd say it sucked and make fun of the band. It's easy to mistake this as filler nowadays, but back then it was a huge draw. No one had seen anything like it, and the characters became somewhat of tastemakers. 
The bands White Zombie and Babes in Toyland saw immense sales after being featured, with the former even reaching the top 40 albums of Billboard. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but I just want to get this all out of the way. Judge would literally sit in the booth for hours recording hundreds of these each season, thinking of broadcast-worthy bits. If the video was truly boring, he'd just banter as the characters, having them take bathroom breaks or even grab a snack. I get to take a leak when the video sucks. Beavis, stay on that damn couch. What are you doing, Beavis? Damn it, buddy! Never come into the bathroom while I'm taking a dump. Go back and watch the damn video. This helped him refine the characters and their dialogue early on. Now, there's a few discrepancies. Beavis and Butthead are noticeably more articulate, which leads to contradictions over how self-aware they actually are. And the reaction shots are usually reused clips from the episodes with no consistency between styles. Regardless, these segments were a saving grace for the earliest seasons, which needed a cost-effective way to retain viewers. The studio behind this season was J.J. Settlemeyer Productions, who boast about producing the first season on their website. It's a bit misleading. They're actually referring to both seasons 1 and 2, as it was originally intended to be a single season. The studio understood what Mike Judge wanted, and their subsequent work proves this. But the team fell behind schedule, resulting in the jarringly off animation. Beavis and Butthead premieres Monday, March 8th on MTV. Beavis and Butthead's premiere was a disaster, as MTV attempted to stall by re-airing the same three episodes daily. Eventually, the show was formally pulled in order to give them time to complete a proper season. Season 2 began two months after the first in May of 1993. The earliest three episodes retained the initial rough animation, clearly intended to have been a part of season 1. But once the budget kicked in, it started looking much closer to the final product. Now having much more time on production, their main concern returned to figuring out how to stretch these characters into a full season. The simplest solution was to add more set pieces. The duo are given jobs at Burger World, enabling them to ruin the days of customers. But more important are the secondary characters. This season introduces McVicker, Coach Buzzcut, and their neighbor Tom Anderson, all of whom would become staples on the show. McVicker is their stuttering principal who tries his best to get rid of the duo, to no avail. You are both suspended for a week! It's often implied that his physical deterioration is due to stress from the boys, which is just sad. <laughs> Coach Buzzcut is a pretty simple character. He's a drill sergeant turned gym teacher who gets obedience through violent threats. You will do this assignment! Tom Anderson is their conservative boomer neighbor who reminisces on the old days while grilling and sipping a cold one. In other words, he's the prototypical Hank Hill, with a voice to match. We were just men doing a job that men had to do. Long before King of the Hill, these characters show just how adept Judge was at satire. The first episode of this season would also debut a female classmate named Daria Morgendorfer. But Mrs. Dickey, Beavis and Butthead are complete imbeciles! Her conception was the result of MTV, apparently the only production note they got after the first season. That was actually the only note from the network, kind of development note. Daria is interesting because she eventually got her own show independent of the duo. Yeah, yeah. Compared to the depressed, ambivalent character she became, here she's just a gifted kid. Her debut is in the very first episode, where she uses them for a presentation about stupidity. Hey, diarrhea. Yeah. You like, get periods? Despite intent to make her a foil, she appears very sporadically throughout the show. So I'll just discuss her evolution now. Daria is one of the only girls Beavis and Butthead never hit on. In fact, showing respect for her. Did you mean that? Or were you just jerking us around? Daria's cool. Over time, her character became more cynical before canonically moving after season 7. Past that, the characters never really reference each other. It's offhandedly remarked that Beavis believes she committed suicide. I know Daria killed herself, I remember that. She didn't kill herself, she just moved away. And in an interview, Daria once admitted she missed them. Do you still keep in touch with those guys? I'd like to. But first, they have to figure out that when the telephone makes that funny sound, you're supposed to pick it up and say hello. I think it'd be fascinating to watch them interact again, but I'm not sure how it'd work. Judge had little to no involvement with Daria's show, and there was intentional obfuscation to distinguish her from their world. You don't want it to be Highland all over again. Not much chance of that happening. 
Unless there's uranium in the drinking water here, too. There's a reason most people don't realize the connection. Anyways, that's all off topic, so let's go back to season two. We're gonna be talking about the penis! <laughs> we'll be talking about the vagina! <laughs> Do you think that's funny, butthead? They clearly had a lot of fun this season pushing just how far the plots could vary in severity. You'll have one episode where their mishandling of firearms crashes a commercial airplane, and another where they just write haikus. There's a bit of an issue with balancing in terms of the duo facing consequences. They're instigators, so you want to see them face repercussion. But that usually doesn't happen. In episode 17, they harass a man until he has a heart attack and passes out. In At The Movies, they wreak havoc on a movie theater before watching a security guard shoot himself in the foot. This is a problem they recognized later on. Part of what makes the characters likable is how harmless they ultimately are. Their stupidity is mostly to their own detriment. <laughs> Even when they do ruin people's days, it isn't malicious. But that aspect of the characters wasn't ironed out yet, leaving a lot of episodes feeling unsatisfying. But I can't fault them too much. This is extremely early on in the show, and they clearly made steps in the right direction. Smells like teen spirit. One decision Judge had to make early on was whether or not the characters had good taste in music. This may seem innocuous, but considering a core part of their design are the band tees, it's actually pretty significant. In episode 15, we're introduced to Stuart, a timid hanger-on who desperately wants to impress them, no matter what. Like, they literally blow up his entire house after huffing carbon monoxide and he defends them. <laughs> Because Stewart is lame, Judge decided to have him rep a band he felt was full of posers. This decision was so detrimental that Winger's reputation was destroyed and skewered throughout pop culture. Beavis and Butthead do a lot of dangerously stupid things that I have no doubt were based on real anecdotes. From huffing paint thinner to jumping in drying machines, it's like they brainstormed exactly what kids shouldn't do and then showed them doing it. I mean, the season ends with them tossing around a live grenade. In general, there's darker implications to their antics. The most clear-cut example is the two-parter No Way Down in Mexico. The duo are roped into a drug trafficking scheme and forced to swallow condoms filled with cocaine. This episode is so infamous that it was quickly banned from re-airing. Compared to every other channel at the time, it was complete anarchy, where most TV shows existed to affirm social norms and praise others. Beavis and Butthead ripped both apart. Where other shows sanitized themselves of even curse words, Beavis and Butthead swallowed condoms filled with cocaine. And season two proved that even though the characters were one note, Mike Judge wasn't, and he was capable of keeping the show fresh. What's so fascinating about Beavis and Butthead becoming so beloved amongst teens is that it was the exact opposite of Judge's intent. In fact, the entire basis of their conception was to criticize the very audience that came to worship them. Frog Baseball was directly inspired by a story he'd overheard from a colleague that left him pondering what kind of teens would do something so idiotic and cruel. The answer he came to was those who watched MTV. Prior to creating the network's cash cow, the 30-year-old had always felt out of touch when watching the channel. Most of their programming sold an image of what was cool, with fashionable aesthetics. Beavis and Butthead, by contrast, discussed everyone around them. Diarrhea, cha-cha-cha, diarrhea, cha-cha-cha. A clear critique of the disconnect between product and consumer. In that sense, MTV seems like the worst place to air the show, because it's an outsider's interpretation of the youth. Judge created the characters to criticize contemporary society, and underlying those initial shorts was an unacknowledged self-loathing. They're mirrors of a culture sowing narcissism, a need for instant gratification, and, as Roger Ebert said, television zombification. It's perhaps the most misunderstood satire of all time. Instead of coming across as vitriolic characters, however, the duo come across as endearing. It took Judge some time to realize this misunderstanding, but as he was continuously approached by fans with their own antics, he came to terms with reality. Against all odds, his characters were considered cool. In an interview, Judge once reminisced, I'm just happy they gave this old, uncool guy a chance. Beavis and Butthead are not real. They are stupid cartoon people, completely made up by this Texas guy who we hardly even know. 
Once season 3 rolled around, a few changes were made behind the scenes. Rough Draft Studios took over animation, and a new writer was hired named Christopher Brown. According to Brown, prior to his tenure, most of the people before him were promo writers for MTV. They, they offered for me to move from Los Angeles to New York to become the first full-time staff writer on the show because up until that point, all the writers were MTV uh, promo writers. As in, their only experience was working on commercials and bits for award shows. In its third season, the show became much more aware of its surroundings. There was a lot more social commentary. And I need to pick out those students who are most likely to run into trouble with the law. Do you want to see their files? I don't need the files. Bring me the yearbook. That kid looks like a criminal. And Buzzcut even uses the Vietnam War to reaffirm his masculinity. I remember those days on the Ho Chi Minh Trail with the mighty Big Red One. There's a lot more references to pop culture and current events. In passing, we see parodies of figures like Steve Urkel, Joey Budafoco, and even Bill Clinton, who visits the school in Citizen Butthead. Last year in Mrs. Dickey's class, I pitched a tent. <laughs> she must be very proud. Episode 5 has the duo kidnap Stewart after learning about the real-life abduction of nine-year-old Katie Beers. Remember the Katie Beers tragedy? Like that girl who was kidnapped by a family friend and locked up under that house? which is just a questionable decision. I don't know why they did that. As you can imagine, this tendency resulted in a lot of TV-centric episodes, in which the driving force comes from their television set. This was a satirization of the fear that kids mimicked what they watched, an element that proved ironic a few months later. Season 3 sought to refine the foundation solidified in Season 2. They start facing comeuppance for their wrongdoings, like when Daria publishes embarrassing photos of their genitals. <laughs> wow, even smaller than I thought. Small dick, I don't know why. <laughs> the show becomes more conscious of how awful they are. Episode 1 is explicitly a meta commentary about how shallow the humor is. Beavis and Butthead go to a comedy club where they tell the same jokes they always do. Uh, a frog in a blender. <laughs> Get it? The only laughs are from each other as they're promptly booed off stage. The episode ends with Beavis lighting a bunch of newspapers on fire, causing the entire club to burn down. We should be on TV. <laughs> this season established Beavis's particular fascination with arson, coining his now iconic chant. Fire! Fire! The show hadn't quite grounded itself yet, so there's some really out there moments. An example of this could be Tornado. Oh! but I prefer couch fishing. Here, the two use a fishing rod to reel people into their house. This includes impaling Stewart's finger, as well as an elderly woman. Then, police kick down the door to arrest them, apparently familiar with the activity. Doing a little couch fishing, are we? As if I couldn't have guessed. Back then, the world was often just as ridiculous as Beavis and Butthead. Well, it's time to talk about the elephant in the room. They have replaced The Simpsons as the show kids love to talk about, Beavis and Butthead, two cartoon characters on MTV. A five-year-old boy in Moraine, Ohio, set his mother's house on fire using a lighter. The accident tragically led to the death of his two-year-old sister. The mother subsequently claimed to news outlets that her son was influenced by the show, citing Beavis's new affinity for fire. He was obsessed with Beavis and Butthead. Uh, every time that he watched them, uh, he would try to mimic what they'd done uh, to the point where he started playing with matches and the like. The incident occurred midway through season three and had dire consequences for the show. It was pushed from its 7 p.m. time slot to air closer to midnight, and all references to fire were censored, with the word banned entirely for the rest of the original run. This controversy was bizarre for multiple reasons. Even from the beginning, producers made sure to inform children that copying the characters was dangerous. But more importantly, the boy had never seen Beavis and Butthead, making the entire allegation against the show pointless. I have talked to Austin Messner, the kid who set the fire, and um, then he kind of just opened up and, and told me the whole story about how he had never seen the show, that his mom called the news before she called the fire department that day. Unfortunately, it didn't end there. Four months later, another crime would be attributed to the show. 
in February of 1994, a New Jersey teen heaved a bowling ball off an overpass, killing an eight-month-old infant. Newspapers quickly denounced it as another Beavis and Butthead copycat, though once again, the teen later admitted to having never seen the show. Beavis and Butthead didn't invent delinquency. They were created to mock it. But because this was the 90s, it couldn't just be left at these kids did something wrong. They must have been manipulated, brainwashed by a show they've never seen. Despite the setbacks and new restrictions, the show carried on with season 3 concluding after a 31 episode run. Right off the bat, I noticed a lot of improv being integrated as small talk. There are scenes of them talking about stuff unrelated to the episode, which is hysterical. That would be cool if they really had like pipes with crap and turds running through them. They do, <laughs> dumbass. How do you think all that crap gets out of your house? It doesn't. It's in my basement in little jars. <laughs> That's pretty disgusting, Beavis. It's a great addition that helps fill otherwise dead air. This season is when Beavis and Butthead become more distinguished from each other. Butthead had always been the de facto leader, but it wasn't acknowledged very heavily. That changes now. Butthead becomes the driving force of their schemes, having to instruct Beavis on what to do. They're no longer equals, with Butthead abusing his friend unprompted. Get up, Butthead, get up! Episode 28 showcases this perfectly. After a snack they bought gets stuck in the vending machine, he orders Beavis to wait there while he begs for change. Okay, I'm gonna go like, get 60 cents. Don't leave here until I get back. <laughs> he manages to haggle a dollar from an old woman before buying a dozen leftover nachos at the gas station. He then abandons his lackey and goes home, as Beavis waits like a loyal dog until the episode ends. In a superficial sense, Butthead is the smart one. He's more conniving. And to match this, we start hearing that coy, sarcastic voice he does for one-liners. I have seen the way. We have the power supreme. Ooh, baby. <laughs> Come to Butthead. We realize that Beavis is usually just roped in. It leaves the viewer wondering if he'd be as hopeless if not for Butthead. Shut up, Beavis. More on that later. Beavis becomes more erratic to where Butthead has to start telling him to calm down. Yeah, voices are cool. I hear voices too. They like tell me to do stuff like stay home from school and watch TV and like break stuff and, and like just... <laughs> Settle down, Beavis. Fittingly, it's this season that we're also introduced to his alter ego, Cornholio. Cornholio first appears in episode 29, though the rules of transformation aren't established until 31. That's because the great Cornholio was the very last in production when the team realized they were one episode short. Looking for a quick plotline, they remembered the one-off gag, and the rest is history. I am Cornholio! I need pee -pee for my bunghole. What could have been a filler episode wound up establishing a staple part of the character. The only issue they really had was finding an excuse to make it happen. With now two controversies under their belt, there were a few roadblocks to getting there. We were trying to figure out how do we justify, I mean, now he can't sniff gas, he can't, yeah. you know, huff paint, you know, all that stuff. In general, their thrill-seeking took a turn away from violence and substance abuse, and I think that was a good thing. It inadvertently forced them to ground the characters and make their motivations mundane. Thus, when the end result is extreme, it's ridiculous, and in turn, funnier. Here, they eventually decided the trigger to be sugar, which gives a lot more variety to how Cornholio appears. Sometimes, simpler can be better. One of my favorite episodes this season is Trouble Urinating, which is entirely about them forgetting how to pee. Hey, butthead. <clears throat> I forgot how to do it. Don't be a butt wipe, Beavis. You just, uh... You just, uh... <laughs> now I forgot. I already mentioned versus the vending machine, but there's also Beavis and Butthead Island, where they get stranded for days on a decorative island at the mall. The water's only a couple feet deep, you know? You can just walk out any time you want. Now, not all of season four is simple. There are quite a few standouts that really showed the extreme premises. In Jump, Beavis and Butthead visit a bank attempting to withdraw a million dollars. However, just as they're turned away, law enforcement appear alleging the banker to have committed fraud and embezzlement. Hey, where are you going? He quickly runs to the fifth story roof, where he threatens suicide. I actually hope he jumps. God, I'm so ashamed. 
What kind of person am I watching this? <laughs> the two inform police that they talked to him before and thus are sent to negotiate. Instead of helping, they laugh and tell him to jump. Could you like jump out that way a little? I have to jump and don't try to talk me out of it. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we understand. The banker, needing any excuse to back out, pretends to have a moral epiphany while speaking to them, running from the ledge and hugging them. He's taken into custody as they complain about not getting their money. I guess we don't get our million dollars now. The episode works extremely well, mainly because they don't have to be there. Their motivations are completely unrelated to what's going on, yet they're a key component to how it ends. This formula of having major events occur around them, completely out of their control, is genius. It treats their entire world as a straight man, as they react predictably and unfazed. A similar episode is Blackout, in which Highland loses all electricity. Beavis and Butthead walk around looking for a television, as a dystopic riot entails. This is unrelated, but I just want to quickly mention the episode with Mr. Manners because it's a personal favorite. He threatens to assault them for not complying in class. Ah, listen you little twerp. This is my job. This is how I make money causing Beavis to scream that he touched them. He sure does like to touch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he tried to touch my wiener. <laughs> what? <laughs> then, a fight breaks out between him and Van Driesen. Oh, and he's voiced by David Spade for some reason. Okay, so I have a note here, and I don't really know how to phrase this better. Beavis and Butthead get... Hornier? From calling sex hotlines to looking under the stalls of women's restrooms, their love quest starts to influence every episode. In season 3, there was a bit more balance between their lust, wrath, and greed, but the two become dead set on scoring. In Teen Talk, Beavis even has a meltdown about how he's never gonna score. We're gonna like, never score, we're gonna be wussies forever! Hey! I warned you about that! Don't make me come up there! Shut up, asswipe! You probably score! And you're a dork! I'm never gonna score! Overall, Season 4 is the first season I'd actually recommend for someone to sit through start to finish. There's a ton of variety, and the improvements help negate the monotony of earlier seasons. MTV's Beavis and Butthead is brought to you by- This video is sponsored by Keeps. Did you know that two out of every three guys will experience hair loss by the time they're 35? Well, thankfully, Keeps has them covered. Keeps is an online subscription service that offers clinically proven, research-backed treatments to hair loss and improving hair growth. Whether you're looking to do that or just take better care of the hair you have, Keeps can develop a routine for you. In addition to their treatments, they have an award-winning, all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. Their physicians help you select the right products and treatments for your specific conditions and goals. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash Bernie or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Bernie. Season 5 began on October 31st, 1994. This one was the most daunting to binge, because it consists of 50 episodes, the longest in the show's run, but it passed a lot faster than I expected. Immediately, the writing is a lot punchier than before. In conjunction with their small talk, there's consistently great one-liners littered throughout. Say something, Stuart. <laughs> really? You wanna talk to me? Wow, that's cool. Let's go to the mall. I know there's this great new sucks. place. Yeah. <laughs> we can go to my house. Beavis and Butthead show solidarity with other degenerates. From catcallers to perverted mall cops, they'll always remark about how cool they are. Those guys are cool. Which is, of course, a thinly veiled insult from the writers. One of them is Todd, a rugged hoodlum who the duo idolize and wish to befriend. Todd's cool. Yeah, <laughs> I think he likes him. <laughs> yeah, let's go hang with him. Todd was first introduced in season 2, appearing sporadically to abuse them. It's this season that he starts appearing consistently, making their existence a living hell. In Safe House, he kicks their door in to use their home as a safe house. Beavis and Butthead pose as members of his gang, causing them to get beaten and arrested. In episode 17, they creep on a female barber, only to find out it's Todd's girlfriend. He chokes and assaults them. The very next episode has Todd breaking in again to host a party, this time forcing them out and trashing the house. In general, it's a painful time to be our protagonists. 
There are so many episodes centering around their sole misfortune, as if an apology for previous seasons. These guys think they're funny, but they're really just like stupid. Butthead spends all of episode 4 suffocating at a piece of chicken, before Beavis repeats the same mistake. In Wet Behind the Rears, the two are publicly humiliated in front of the school while in their underwear. <laughs> this is shown to be a deliberate plot by Principal McVicker and Coach Buzzcut. But don't feel too bad, because most of their comeuppance is a direct result of their love quest. They are at their most despicable. With the first episode having Butthead hitting on a 7th grader, Have you ever, like, been with an older man? And calling kindergartners flat. These chicks are flat. <laughs> yeah. In Spanish Fly, they attempt to roofie girls at their school, accidentally spiking a guy's drink, who gets an erection while wrestling Beavis. <laughs> Hell, women literally has them beat up by female activists. Hey, baby, where are you? <laughs> Season 5 has a ton of variety, all of which are executed very well. One of the most creative is episode 22, Dream On. The two fall asleep and imagine themselves in different television shows, which is as great as you'd expect. The TV premises remain lovably dumb. There's Screamers, where they literally just scream at everyone they see. But my favorite is Pregnant Paws. Beavis watches a spot about pregnancy and gets afraid that he's displaying symptoms, only to find out he needs to take a dump. Of course, one episode I have to mention is Lightning Strikes. Beavis and Butthead watch a documentary about Benjamin Franklin, learning that he flew a kite with Key during a storm. They decide to copy this, only to be struck by lightning and admitted to the emergency room. There, a media watchdog visits to inquire about what they'd watched on TV. She is later interviewed, claiming that rock music had encouraged them. These two boys were left unsupervised watching music videos that depicted rock stars they thought were cool. This was a direct response to the controversies where they explicitly call the concerned parents stupid. That chick is stupid. <laughs> yeah, I hope nobody imitates her. Another notable side character is the disgraced attorney Joe Adler. In sexual harassment, Beavis and Butthead hire Adler to sue a classmate for giving them erections. I'm being, you know, sexually harassed by Kimberly. What? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> She's giving me a stiffy. This same character appears in Mike Judge's live action film Extract, portrayed by Gene Simmons of Kiss fame. That's the only reason I brought this guy up. Season 5 is when they nailed the writing and structure of the show. The comedic timing is perfect, and they struck a great balance between formats. My only complaint is that I wish there were more episodes placing the two in intense scenarios, like Jump from Season 4. Now, the complaint is a bit short-sighted, given that just over a year later, the concept would be transformed into their theatrical debut. As Season 5 neared the end of production, Judge was approached to renew his contract, but he'd grown tired of the show and at the time was busy developing what would eventually become King of the Hill. As Judge reviewed his options, he realized that all necessitated an eighth season. I think my contract, like with all the renewing options, went to eight seasons. <laughs> eight seasons. Using his leverage, he managed to convince executives to end the show prematurely at season seven in favor of doing a feature length movie. This would, naturally, affect the still ongoing production of season six, which was reduced to only 20 episodes. Due to these circumstances, Season 6 is much more grounded in smaller scale than 5. It focuses on the established side characters in somewhat of a return to form. Check it out, butthead! Somebody left their locker open! <laughs> Let's close it for him. <laughs> Let's close it again! <laughs> yeah. Most episodes take place at school, such as Sprout, The Mystery of the Morningwood, and U.S. History. That last one hilariously begins with Daria explaining the magic bullet theory. Clearly the assassination was a conspiracy. Thank you, Daria. That gave me the chills. There are a few moments that shake up the formula, though. Episode 14 has Principal McVicker and Coach Buzzcut actually get in trouble for abusing them. Then, two episodes later, the duo stalk Van Driesen to watch him and his girlfriend hook up. But the most interesting part of season 6 by far are the specials. There was a Halloween one, but that's not what I'm talking about. For Christmas, MTV aired a 40-minute animated celebration that, bizarrely, gave insight to the trauma they've inflicted on others. There are two parts to the holiday episode, one about Beavis and the other about Butthead. 
Ha Ha Humbug is a parody of A Christmas Carol. Beavis attempts to watch pornography before being interrupted by the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. This is where the iconic image of Beavis seeing his own grave originates from, where it declares that he never scored. It ends with Beavis almost self-reflecting, before Butthead wakes him up mid-thought. Now, while he didn't take the lessons to heart, it's worth pointing out that they at least felt Beavis was capable of moral reform. The same cannot be said for Butthead, as we'll see in part 2. Between the episodes is a segment called Letters to Santa Butthead. A month prior, MTV ran promotions asking viewers to send in fan mail, meaning that yes, these are all real. <laughs> As it turns out, a lot of female fans adore Beavis, with one in particular writing love letters to him. Dear Santa Butthead, all I want for Christmas is Beavis. Butthead refuses to accept this fact and whips Beavis out of anger. This is starting to piss me off. Give me that letter, buddy, now! Ow! Ah! Come on, buddy, give me that letter now! <laughs> Damn it, Beavis, if you ever try to order me around again, I'm gonna kick your butt so hard it'll turn inside out and come out your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> 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 Once it's over, part 2 begins, a parody of It's a Wonderful Life. The episode starts with the side characters praying for God to kill Beavis and Butthead. I'm not joking. Just make him go away. It wouldn't be your fault. Please, God, help us. The end would justify the means. We need a miracle. Come on, God. Okay. In response, Butthead's guardian angel tries to convince him to commit suicide by showing how great life would be if he wasn't born. And sure enough, it's true. Anderson is happy, Burger World is prosperous, and McVicker looks a lot healthier. Even Daria is affected, noting that they weren't there to ruin her perception of men. And you weren't there to destroy Daria's image of boys. But the most shocking revelation is what happened to Beavis. <laughs> Where's Beavis? Beavis? <laughs> I don't think you want to know. In this timeline, we find him to be an upstanding citizen volunteering at the homeless shelter with Stuart. Uh, what was Stuart? <laughs> Stuart has self-esteem now. You weren't there to destroy it. That sucks. I mentioned before that there are moments where you wonder how bad Beavis would be without Butthead. Well, this is the canonical answer. He'd actually be a good person. When Butthead tries to drag him away, Beavis is even defended by the homeless, who reference that he's a good kid. Hey man, leave the kid alone. Yeah, he's a good kid. This all goes to show just how misunderstood Beavis actually is. He isn't evil, he's just a naive kid looking for acceptance, who found validation in an abusive narcissist. Many such cases. Unfortunately, these visions do little to convince Butthead. They return to the original timeline where their angel falls into a river. Now, that's pretty much the end of the special. The only thing left to mention is an actual letter they received from prison. I bet you two will have a better Christmas than I will this year. I didn't rape or kill anybody. The rest of season 6 is as you'd expect. It ends with Beavis and Butthead drinking non-alcoholic drinks and then failing a sobriety test anyways. Overall, it was much better than I'd have imagined given their split attention. There are a lot of great episodes, with the Christmas special being a standout must-watch. Beavis and Butthead to America was released on December 20th, 1996. With a budget of $12 million, it made over five times that in returns, becoming the largest box office opening in December at the time. This movie is incredible. If you're to watch even just one thing talked about in this video, I'd recommend this the most. Do America places Beavis and Butthead into an international spy thriller, unwittingly saving the planet from apocalypse. Whoa. This is the coolest thing I have ever seen. There's so many references to the show that I didn't appreciate at the time. The burglars who start the chain of events first appeared in season 5. Beavis' freak out on the bus is a callback to his meltdown in season 4. Even their motive of finding a TV is lifted from the episode Blackout. Oh, and Butthead's dad is voiced by David Letterman. Uh, hey. I don't want to spoil too much about the movie because I'd rather you just watch it yourself. I just want to show this sequence in which they spent thousands of dollars on technology revolutionized by Disney to animate their stupid dance in 3D. And I can't forget the peyote scene based on Rob Zombie's artwork featuring an original song by White Zombie.
Overall, the film feels like an incredible celebration of their status as cultural touchstones, and stands alone beyond the show. Judge has gone on record to state that the production was very ad hoc due to the staff's background in television. Needless to say, they did a great job, reflected by the film's massive success. Uh, Beavis, I'm going to kick your- Beavis, why did you do that? He said he was gonna kick my ass! <laughs> Season 7 is, as alluded to before, the last of Beavis and Butthead's original run. Before even talking about the episodes, I want to point out that for the first time, created by Mike Judge is in the intro. Despite conceiving two of the biggest pop cultural icons of the generation, Judge didn't own the rights to his own characters. He signed away everything to MTV. You gotta remember, no, uh, nobody owns it. <laughs> Matt Groening doesn't own The Simpsons. But with Mike, because he got such a screwy deal, that they can make this comes out and he's going, oh, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, well, at least yeah. they put my name on it. It's an unfortunate reality check. Judge wouldn't have a career without MTV, and it's why we ever got to see Beavis and Butthead and later King of the Hill. But to get it, he had to sign a predatory contract forfeiting ownership. It took seven seasons and a movie for Judge to even get recognition on the title card. Surprisingly, the format of the show changed significantly after the movie. Now, three episodes are played per half hour, with a music video squished in between. The animated segments are no longer interrupted as less emphasis is placed on the commentary. In fact, all of those segments would actually be recycled from previous seasons, probably so Judge didn't have to record more. I'll show you my butthole if you want. <laughs> It truly does feel like the crew got burnt out on the characters. I guess there was no way they could surpass the movie and they knew the show was ending. So it reverted back to simplicity. With that said, I still enjoyed it. Nosebleed is reminiscent of season 4 with a simple problem aggravated to the extreme. <laughs> and a great day has Beavis and Butthead unwittingly blackmail a serial killer, one of my favorite moments in the whole show. What? I mean, hi, I mean, we just wanted to tell you that there's um, some blood out here, and I um, mean, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how it got there. <laughs> it's probably not blood. Uh, just, just forget it. No way. I'm never gonna forget this. Here's a buck. Go home. Whoa. Cool. After a certain point, even the show begins to question the future of these two kids. At least now we can get on with our lives. <laughs> that existential question of what lies ahead is the foundation of the finale. Titled Beavis and Butthead Are Dead, it's the show's 200th episode. Due to a misunderstanding, everyone believes the two are dead and decide to celebrate. McVicker stops shaking and the school staff hold a party as everyone recounts their sins. Um, Daria, I've seen you talking with them. Well, I guess it's kind of sad that they're dead and all but it's not like they had bright futures ahead of them. While much of it is a clip show, the premise is a commentary on premature death and how people use it to their advantage and paint an idealized image of the deceased. We can exploit their deaths to raise money for the school. Those two owe the school for all the damage they caused. Besides, we could use a new teacher's lounge. There's not a ton of exploration to this, but it's there. In the end, Beavis and Butthead crash the memorial charity, taking the donations and walking into the sunset thinking they're rich. We're rich. We don't have to go to school ever again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty damn cool. And with that, the show ended as it started, as under-elaborated social commentary. Well, it's no secret that the show didn't end there. But before discussing the actual final season, I want to talk about how difficult it was to watch this show. Yeah, the title wasn't just clickbait, I did do this illegally. Most of seasons 1 to 3 are completely unavailable for digital or physical purchase. In fact, of the 200 original episodes, 80 have never been re-released. Even the ones that have are stripped of their commentary due to licensing issues. Basically, it's impossible to legally binge the show in its entirety. There are a number of reasons for why that is. The early episodes feature a lot of content that both MTV and Judge regret including. From animal abuse to drug use, even episodes that have seen distribution are often redacted of these elements. Additionally, after the fire incident, the master copy of many episodes were altered permanently, making a full restoration impossible. The most conclusive collection out there officially is the Mike Judge collection, with every episode handpicked by the creator himself. 
While I understand the legal barriers prevent a large portion from ever seeing the light of day, I do hope that one day we see a full release of the show. Even if they're not good, there's historical value, and that alone should be enough to justify preservation. In July of 2010, MTV announced that Mike Judge would be returning to create a new Beavis and Butthead series. It premiered on October 27th, 2011, and ran for a total of 22 episodes. While many were skeptical of what it would be, older fans were pleasantly surprised to find that it held right up to the original. Retaining the same art style, just in higher quality, it's almost as if they never left. But they had, and MTV changed a lot since they were gone. The once hub for teenagers had turned into a channel for reality television, near unrecognizable of what came before. Season 8 returns to the original format of having episodes broken up by commentary. You're not a firework. <laughs> Damn it, butthead! Shut up! <laughs> to mix things up though, they also riff over shows like Teen Moms and Jersey Shore. It's not entirely out of left field, though there are moments you can tell Judge is just pissed off about what they're currently airing. She loves hot salami. Yeah, she does. Uh, yeah. She loves hot salami, see, he, he means schlong. There's some great episodes here, like their parodies of Twilight and Super Size Me. People feared that Judge lost touch of the characters, but he was able to instead bring new life back into them. Oh, and also the fire ban was lifted. Fire! 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 When episode 1 aired, it received over 3 million live viewers. It was considered a ratings hit, and MTV thought the characters were back. However, as the season continued, viewership plummeted with the final episode dropping under a million. While I feel the season was good, that wasn't enough to keep people interested. In the age of YouTube, their commentary was no longer novel. The characters weren't edgy, having long since been surpassed by other animated sitcoms. And there really wasn't any opportunity to attract new fans. But most critically, the channel's primary audience was prepubescent girls. That's not an assertion, Judge said this himself. Due to its poor reception, the show wasn't renewed. And for the next decade, that was the end of Beavis and Butthead. In the past year, there's been talks of both a new season and film being produced for Paramount+. Plus. And while I probably will have to watch it out of necessity, I do wonder how the issues that arose in season 8 will be absolved. Is streaming enough to prevent the clashing of target demographics? Will significant changes be made to make them more edgy? I personally don't know what I would do to bring these characters back. There's something to be said about the age of streaming, where once cultural phenomena are turned into, hey, there's a new season of this show I used to like. Beavis and Butthead was subversive because of how different it was to everything around it, and it just isn't anymore. They're very much products of their time, with each season shaped by the culture and circumstances that surrounded it. Much like its protagonists, the show only persisted through a combination of luck and pure resilience, in turn forming one of the most memorable icons of the 90s. On its face, Beavis and Butthead is a very shallow, surface-level show, and when you dig deeper, it still is. But it's only then that you realize just how impressive its success truly was, amidst several media storms, budgetary issues, and an ever-changing pop culture. Perhaps there is a way for them to exist in our times, but the chances of the two returning to the throne are as slim as their chances to score. 